Jesus said, I am the true vine. I come from Port Stewart. And in all my life, I've only heard one criticism of my hometown. It's a beautiful seaside resort. Is that right, Arm? Yeah. There you are. And I've only ever heard one criticism. And that is, there are no trees in Port Stewart. No trees. No trees. And I can't argue with that because of the uh, sharp uh, sea breezes. They just don't last. They just don't last. So it's a fair criticism. Although I must say that I'm amazed at this fact because the sun always shines in Port Stewart. So I can't really understand why trees don't grow. Now, although uh, technically a, a vine isn't a tree, there's a vine growing in Hampton Court Palace that has survived for 255 years. Yes, pity they wouldn't grow it in Port Stewart. But anyway, there you are. And it's still, after 255 years, it still produces much good fruit. And this great vine is called in Hampton Court Palace. It is a, a Vitus vinifera, vinifer whatever that is the type. And it actually produces black Hamburg, black Hamburg uh, fruit, 255 years old. And it's recorded as being the largest grapevine in the whole world. Amazing, 255 years. It measures four meters around its base and its longest branch is 40 meters long. 40 oh, yeah, meters that's long. Style, that's a long one, isn't it? And it was planted in 1768 by Capability Brown. And it was planted from a cutting from another, another palace. The average crop of black desert grapes from the grapevine annually is 600 pounds. That's a big crop, isn't it? 600 pounds. But compared to the fruit produced by God's disciples, it's minuscule. It's minuscule. The fruit that we produce as believers is just unimaginable. That's because we're trained, fed, and pruned by God himself. Remember, we are planted by God himself. And uh, we are part, we're connected directly to the true vine. Now this uh, I am the true vine is the last of the I am sayings uh, peculiar to John's gospel. And we've noted uh, up to now all the first six. So this is the seventh and we complete that little series tonight. Jesus is the true vine. Now, whenever Jesus said, I am, uh, I want to refresh our memories of just how important that was. Whenever the Jews heard Jesus say, I am the true vine, they were livid. Because Jesus, by saying this phrase, I am, I am the light of the world and all, all the seven of them, he was claiming, he was pronouncing himself to be God in the flesh. And of course, the Jews uh, were livid. They were really angry and tried to kill him on occasions. Have you ever met somebody, and this is because I have a shocking memory, particularly for names. Is not that right, Sadie? <laughs> have you ever met somebody, you're down the street and you meet somebody, and you recognise you've met them as an old friend from way back yonder, and they come up and the hands out and say, Hello, Laurie, how you doing this weather? And you look at them and you say, oh, hello, um, how are you doing yourself? <laughs> the name doesn't come forward. Well, in a way, that's the problem Moses had when he came as commanded by God. God wanted to speak to Moses to command him to lead the children of Israel out of their captivity in Egypt. And uh, Moses he had this problem about names, God and names. Uh, and we read 
God said, uh, Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say? God said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you. So this was important because this was the first time, well, it's the first time that God used this name, I am, and it's translated by the word Yahweh, Yahweh from the Hebrew. So whenever Jesus said, I am, he was saying, I am Yahweh, yes, I am the one true living God. By calling himself, I am Yahweh, God is saying that he is the self-existent, independent God of the universe. Our God is not dependent on anybody or anything, not like us. He is totally and absolutely independent of everything. There was a time in history when nothing existed. Nothing existed except God or triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Nothing else existed. So God has always been, always is, and always will be. The great I am. And although the divine name, I am, translated Yahweh, was first used in Genesis, we find it recorded in Genesis, but God didn't give it as his proper name. His personal name. Yahweh simply is and always was and always will be. You see, the point of our God being eternal is that we can trust him with everything. And we said something about that this morning. Yahweh is always near to his people and he loves us openly. The vine, this picture of the vine is a favourite metaphor to a picture uh, to describe the children of Israel. It's used much. The vine, uh, the children of Israel were likened to a vine, particularly in the Old Testament. And time and time again, the people of Israel are likened to a vine. For example, in uh, Psalm 80 we read, God says, you brought a vine out of Egypt, the psalmist says about God. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. So here God's saying to Israel, Israel, I planted you. You're my vine. I planted you in this land that I have given to you, the promised land, Canaan, the land of Canaan, the promised land. And the purpose that I have planted you, I planted you in Canaan, was that you would bear much good fruit. That was the whole point. He wanted Israel to produce fruit for the blessing of the whole world. The Lord said to the people of Israel in uh, Jeremiah 2.21, listen to this. God said to the children of Israel, I planted you a choice vine entirely of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? Israel disappointed God. The Lord didn't receive the fruit he was looking for from Israel. He said that they had turned degenerate and become a wild growth rather than the pure vine that he had planted in the land of Canaan. The vine of Israel proved false. Jesus is talking here to his closest friends. He has just told them that he is going away. He's going to leave them. He was going to ascend into heaven. And Jesus, they were uh, discouraged. What were they going to do when Jesus left them? And to encourage them, Jesus said to the 11 disciples, he said, I am the true vine. 
I am the true vine. And it was only a short time, of course, before Judas betrayed the Lord Jesus. Remember, Jesus betrayed Jesus with a kiss. How awful is that? Jesus, here in this passage, is preparing the 11 disciples. Remember, Judas has left, about to betray him. And he want, Jesus wants to encourage the disciples by saying, I am the true vine. And he goes on to teach them. Knowing how disturbed the 11 disciples were, what would they do without Christ's physical presence with them? So he encouraged them. And even though the 11 uh, would no longer enjoy his physical presence, them and us, of course, continue to be spiritually nourished by the Lord Jesus himself, by being connected to the one true vine. We are the branches, he is the true vine, and if we're connected to him, then we will be nourished and sustained forever. That's why Jesus is the true vine. Israel left God, they were a disappointment to him, they didn't produce the much good fruit that God had expected from them. This nourishment that we receive from the Lord Jesus and we're sustained by him encourages our development, yes? Because we know that we have a direct connection as believers to the Lord Jesus himself. Jesus is the true vine. Secondly, we are the branches. We read in verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, the whole point of being a child of God is to bear much fruit. That's the whole point, that we're believers, to bear much fruit. I had a friend well, sort of a friend, uh, many, many years ago in Port Stewart. And uh, he, he really believed that he would never get sick. He believed because he was a Christian, he would never be sick. He also believed, uh, although he was a, a working class fellow, although he was, he believed that the Lord would supply him with great riches. He said, I remember him saying to me, that Reynolds, he called the fellow, and I remember he went to the window and see you out there, Laurie. One in the morning, I'm going to look out there and my Rolls Royce will be there. Rolls Royce. A Rolls Royce. It didn't work out, sadly, for him. He did get sick and he never got a Rolls Royce. You see, the problem with this fellow, the problem with his fellow was he believed it was in himself, Right? He didn't have a, a sure and certain connection to the true vine. He believed that these things would come from himself. He, whenever say he was charismatic, he was a very nice fellow, very pleasant and good, good company, good to be with. But he believed that he generated these things. It wasn't the true fruit that God had saved him to produce. And Jesus says, look at that in verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. See, there's nothing in me. I'm standing here uh, trying to explain this passage to you, how important it is. But it's not me. If I tell you I'm a very shy person, you'd say, ha, oh, away with you. But I am, because this isn't me. This is the Lord uh, producing fruit, if you like, through me. I am a very a shy person. You see, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. I believe that. It's not inherent in us. Paul understood the importance of relying on the Lord Jesus for sustenance and strength to continue the work. Philippians 4 and 13, Paul says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And that's the same with us. We can do whatever God calls us to do. 
He will supply the strength and nourishment because we're connected. We're the branches connected to the one true vine. He will supply the need. Have you been in the church? Uh, maybe here. Mike's come up to you and says, I've got a wee problem next Sunday. Is there any possibility you could, uh, and he said, could you do this for the fellowship, you see? And maybe it's happened to you and you think to yourself, Mike says to you, can you do this? And you say, I'm not sure, Mike. I'm not sure that I'm gifted to, to be able to do that. Hmm? But you see, Mike will say that as the leader in the church, he would say that to encourage you because he believes you have that gift, yes? And God would supply the need, yes? He'll supply the whatever is needed for that, yes? Because if you're truly connected to the true vine, then Jesus himself will do for you what has to be done. Paul says, I can do all things. And that's whatever the leadership of the church asks you to do. You can do it with the power of Jesus in your life. Jesus' disciples, that's you and me, depend on being connected to him for our spiritual lives, our ability to serve him effectively. It comes directly from the Lord Jesus himself. The fruit we produce isn't Rolls Royces. It isn't a, a, a really good health system and what have you, yes? Our fruit is from the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the fruit that we are expected to produce in abundance for the glory of God himself. Jesus makes it clear that the fruit we produce is not inherent in us. And this is something we all must remember. We must always remember that we can do whatever God calls us to do because he will supply the sustenance to make us be able to do it. We live in a world, uh, we were talking about this this afternoon, we live in a world that is continually perplexing. It's hard to understand just where the world is going to in these days. I don't understand it. And uh, I would love to believe that certain things in our world would stop now. That people would, one of my daughters said to me one time, Dad, wake it up and smell the coffee. And I think that's what needs to happen in the world. Some sanctified common sense needs to come in. See, from pulpits in this land, pulpits in this land who claim to be Christian churches throughout these islands. We hear things that fly distinctly in the face of what we read in Holy Scripture. We were called to ministry in uh, West Yorkshire in Dewsbury. And we got there, got the house set up and all the rest of it. And uh, the fellowship said, Laurie, Agnes, why don't you take a wee break before you get started? Somebody at a caravan in a lovely place. And uh, I said, take our caravan, go up there for a week and uh, get ready for the onslaught that's going to come. So we went up here and to a North Yorkshire church, big one, packed. We went there on a Sunday morning. And the pastor was talking about Adam and Eve. And I was sitting there taking it all in and he said this, he said this, Adam and Eve, of course, never actually existed. It's a myth, fiction at its most fictional, a story that revels in the delights of make-believe. Now you can imagine, <laughs> I, was, I was sitting there in the middle of these uh, maybe three or four hundred people, it was a big big Baptist church in North Yorkshire and I couldn't believe the words I was hearing. This guy was saying that the Bible's all wrong. It's all a story, a myth. And that's what's happening throughout pulpits with throughout these islands. That the clear, vivid description of things in the Bible are being taken and twisted. Twisted. And people are taking it in. It's disgraceful. It's disgraceful. God will judge severely 
in the last judgment, he will judge severely on people who are leading people, little children, away from the truth. These are false prophets. Now, they're obviously not branches connected to the true vine. These aren't true uh, branches. And the Lord helps us to understand this. He said in Matthew 7 and 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Yes? You see, the fruit that they produce has nothing to do with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's nothing to do with that. It's an entertainment. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes? Or figs gathered from... Uh, let me read that again. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes? Or figs from thorn bushes? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased trees bear bad fruit. Friends, we depend on the Lord Jesus. We depend on this book you all have a copy of. What you read there is the truth. It's the truth. You can stand on what that said. If you're discussing your faith with somebody and you quote a verse of scripture to them in context, yes? And they say, oh, no, it doesn't mean that. You can stand firm in saying that is the truth. Why? Because Jesus, you are connected. You're a branch connected to the true vine. And you can stand on this word and you'll never be defeated. People may argue with you and fight with you about it. But you will always be right because this is God's holy word. We depend on Jesus as branches connected to the true vine for everything. He gives us life. Acts 17, 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. He saves us from the penalty of our sin. We belong to him. We are branches connected to the true vine. Romans 5 and 10, we read clearly. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. No one can serve God effectively until he is that branch connected clearly to the Lord Jesus. We are, anything we try to do for God will be unsuccessful. Jesus is the true vine. We are the branches. And finally, the Father is the vine dresser. In verse 1 we read, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. Jesus tells us in this uh, metaphor, this uh, I am saying, he tells us that there are three, three characters in this metaphor. First of all, I am the true vine, is the Lord Jesus. You are the branches, that's you and me. And finally, my father is the vine dresser, that is God the Father. So you have these three people involved in the metaphor. Jesus spells out that connected to the true vine are two separate types of branches. Firstly, fruitful vine branches and secondly, fruitless branches. Fruitful branches will one day receive the award, the reward of heaven, eternal life, which of course begins at the moment of our conversion. The moment we are converted, do you remember back to the moment you were converted and how you were keen to uh, to share your faith with you. Maybe you're more hesitant now, but I remember whenever I was first converted, I was just telling everybody about the Lord Jesus paid the price for my sin. And I remember uh, being with a group of folks 
walking down Port Stewart Prom, I remember as well, and we had tracks, and we were giving out tracks and inviting people to a meeting. And I was walking past one of the uh, chemist shops, and I said to the, it was a more experienced Christian, I said, hold on, I'll go in here and give a track to the, the people behind the counter. And he said, well, maybe not, maybe not a good idea. Well, so we passed on and chatted to folks. So I was really keen to tell people about my faith. You see, I was a fruitful branch, which you all are fruitful branches, producing much good fruit for the Lord Jesus. Fruitful branches are refined and improved by the Father's sharp and loving pruning knife. You see, in our, uh, as a branch, if things are getting uh, out of kilter, God will come along and he will prune. He will cut off what is not working so well to encourage growth. That's what happens in the vine, okay? We cut off what's uh, decaying to improve the growth in the good fruitful branches. Everything that is old and dead on the fruitful branch gets pruned away to encourage further growth for his glory. But there's another type of branch connected to the true vine. Verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. This is very serious. The Father, remember, whenever Jesus is talking, uh, saying this, Judas has just come out of the upper room. And he's gone to do his dastardly deed uh, eventually in the garden. The father removed Judas, the fruitless branch from the vine. He removed him from the, the band of disciples, the 12 disciples. He removed Judas and left the 11 disciples. This was the work of God. Now it's true that every congregation... Every congregation has men and women. We have good, fruitful branches, and sadly, we have bad, fruitless branches. And this is very serious. They may give every appearance of spiritual life, yes? We were talking this afternoon about, uh, we mentioned two men who uh, had high positions in the church, in the Reformed churches, and it turned out that they weren't connected to the true vine at all. They weren't connected to the true vine. One of them, uh, uh, both of these were married men with families, yes, in high positions in Reformed churches. One of them uh, found a mate on the internet, was flirting, you know the way it is, and well, I hope you don't know how it is, but were flirting on the internet and left their family. He left his family and went to London to live with this woman that he met on the internet. Shocking. Had every appearance with one of the one I'm talking about who met this girl on the internet was the pastor of a very strict, but uh, strict and particular Baptist church. And he just walked out, left his wife and five, two boys, just walked out and left them. Now he had every appearance of being a believer, every appearance of being a fruitful branch. But God removed him. He took him away. The other fella we were talking about, sadly, a very handsome young man, married a lovely girl, Two, uh, it went tw two. He had twin boys. No, that's two. Didn't have two twin boys. Isn't that right? Yeah. That would be four, wouldn't it? Um, he worked as a, an insurance man. He met a, a girl who was dying of cancer. Left his wife, twin boys, and went and lived with her. Just. He was a, an elder in a local church. It was just mind-blowing. You see, it was a fruitless bride. And every appearance of being saved, every appearance, but obviously wasn't connected to...
to the true vine. Judas wasn't connected to the true vine. Although he had every appearance of being a believer. And John makes it clear that there are those who had the appearance of a believer, but obviously were. For example, in John's first letter, chapter 2, we read, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they, that they all are not of us. <coughs> Judas Iscariot had every appearance of being a faithful branch. He was involved in every way with the Lord Jesus' ministry. Remember, he was involved healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons. It was amazing, his ministry. But it was fruitless. There was no real fruit in his life. That night, in the upper room, there were two types of branches. There were 11 true, fruitful branches. The 11 disciples. And there was the one bad, fruitless branch, Judas Iscariot. God removed him from the, from the uh, vine. There's no thought, and I have to uh, say this strongly uh, so that you can understand. There is no way a true believer, a fruitful branch, could ever leave. It's not possible that a true believer can lose their salvation. That is not possible. Jesus himself said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I spoke to you, I think it was the last time I was up here, I spoke about how with this triple hold with the Lord Jesus. We cannot lose our salvation. I can't say this strongly enough. We cannot lose our salvation. Ultimately, Judas Iscariot was not a true believer. Yes, he left. He left. God removed him. The two men that I spoke about were obviously not true believers. You can't lose your salvation. It's important that we understand that. If we are abiding in the Lord Jesus, if we are following him faithfully, receiving sustenance from him through the true vine, then we will be encouraged to bear much more good fruit for his glory. Verse 2b, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that he may bear more fruit. Jesus is the true vine. We are the branches. The Father is the vine dresser. Verse 5, whoever abides in me, I and him, he it is that bears much fruit. In the natural world, fruit is the result of a healthy uh, plant producing. It's what uh, uh, the plant is produced, created to produce good fruit, like the black grapes at Hampton Court Palace. In Genesis 1 we read, And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plant yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. So with us. We're converted to bear much fruit for the Lord Jesus. The believer's fruit is guaranteed by God himself. We are directly connected to the true vine the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the true vine, Jesus said. 